Just last week, a hacker discovered one of the most high-severity exploits we've seen, allowing anyone to compromise every single Microsoft Entra tenant in the world. If you're not familiar, Microsoft Entra is a suite of services designed for identity and access management, essentially acting as the gateway to Microsoft services such as Microsoft Azure and Microsoft 365. To be clear, this means that anyone had the ability to compromise and control any service being hosted on Azure globally, or to gain access to all of the files, documents, and emails from any organization in the world that uses the Microsoft 365 suite. If you don't know, Azure is the second largest cloud computing platform in the world, which is essentially Microsoft's equivalent to AWS. This means that every single organization that hosts their services on Azure, including governments, healthcare, and private companies, were all vulnerable. In fact, if you host anything on Azure yourself, or if your organization uses the Microsoft 365 suite, anybody would have been able to not only access, but also modify anything in your tenancy with the highest set of permissions known as Global Admin. To make things even worse, simply accessing data would leave no logs or audit trail at all, essentially making detection impossible, and only a minimal trace would be left if the attacker actually chose to modify data. There's no catch here. This vulnerability really is as serious as it sounds, and even the security researcher that discovered it stated that this is the most impactful vulnerability that they would ever find. This vulnerability consists of two components. The first is a special type of undocumented token, called actor tokens, that Microsoft uses in their own backend for service-to-service -service communication. We'll take a look into what these actor tokens are shortly. The second part was a critical flaw in their legacy, but still active, Azure AD Graph API that failed to properly validate the originating tenant, allowing these tokens to be used for cross-tenant access. While this might sound complex, the vulnerability itself is shockingly simple. An attacker can simply generate one of these actor tokens in their own tenant that they control, and then they can use this token through the Azure AD Graph API to authenticate as any user, including a global admin, in any other tenant globally. The security researcher also points out that there was no setting that the victim tenants could have enabled to mitigate this. On top of this, the vulnerable API allowed attackers to make any modification in the victim tenant that a real global admin could have made. And as if this doesn't sound bad enough, both generating an actor token and using the Azure Graph API for read operations do not generate any logging whatsoever. When it comes to write operations, logs would be generated, but it would just look like a legitimate user within the victim tenant was performing the operation, not a third-party attacker. Now that we understand the basics of the attack, let's take a look at what these actor tokens actually are in more detail. Actor tokens are not publicly documented by Microsoft, meaning it takes a little bit of reverse engineering to see and understand them. Essentially, actor tokens are used in the background for service-to-service -service communication. Their purpose is so that a Microsoft service can act as a given user, temporarily mimicking their set of permissions. I couldn't find any concrete examples for what these actor tokens are used for practically, so I'll outline an example with my current understanding, but keep in mind that this may need to be taken with a grain of salt. Let's say that somebody sends you an email with a link to a private Word Online document similar to a Google Doc. Microsoft's email service, known as Microsoft Exchange, would need to decide whether or not it should embed a document preview. If you have access to the document, it should add a thumbnail to the email, but if you don't have access, it should not. Of course, once you click on the link in the email, it would load up Word Online normally, and your access to the document would be checked firsthand. However, how would the email server know whether or not to display the thumbnail? In short, Microsoft Exchange would need to use an actor token and try to access the document on your behalf, in the background, using your set of permissions in order to determine whether it's okay to display the preview. Just to be clear, this means that Microsoft Exchange is using an actor token to act on your behalf and access the document as yourself in order to run the permissions check. This is just one example that I came up with, but the principle remains the same. 
There are times when a Microsoft service might need to act on your behalf with your set of permissions in the background, and to achieve this, they use an actor token. It's also worth noting that there are no logs when an actor token is generated, and they cannot be revoked prematurely. Now, let's take a look at what one of these actor tokens looks like. An actor token is just a JSON web token known as a JWT. This is just a long string of base64 URL encoded characters. When you decode it, it looks something like this. The actor token contains the tenant ID that it was issued to. Just to provide some context, it would have been Microsoft Entra that issued this actor token to the service that requested it, such as Exchange, allowing it to impersonate any user within the specified tenant. In this video, we'll use Exchange as the service requesting the token, however it could have been any Microsoft service. Additionally, it's worth noting that these actor tokens have an expiry date exactly 24 hours after the token was issued. It's also worth noting that this is a signed JWT, meaning Entra signed it before it was issued and sent to Exchange. So now, Exchange can use this token for 24 hours to impersonate any user within the specified tenant. This is the first step of impersonation. Now, to actually impersonate a specific user, Exchange would proceed to embed this token into another, separate token that it creates and sends to the resource provider, which we'll call impersonation tokens. Within this impersonation token, the actor token field will contain the original, encoded, actor token previously issued from Entra. In the name ID field, a specific user ID will be placed, specifying which exact user to impersonate. This name ID field is actually referred to as a net ID on the Azure Graph API side, however, we'll just refer to them as user IDs for the rest of this video to avoid confusion. Exchange is now free to generate as many of these impersonation tokens as it wants within the 24-hour window given by the actor token, impersonating any user within the tenant specified in the actor token. So far, this makes sense. However, there's one massive issue. The actor tokens issued from Entra are signed JWTs, meaning that Entra signed them. However, the impersonation tokens that Exchange creates are unsigned JWTs. This enables an attacker to create and modify these impersonation tokens manually. Just to recap, this means that once an actor token is issued, anyone that gets their hands on it would be able to create an infinite amount of impersonation tokens from it within a 24-hour window for every single user in a tenant. There are no logs created when these tokens are used or issued and cannot be prematurely revoked. If one of these actor tokens were to be leaked, it could be used to access all of the data in an entire tenant without any useful telemetry or mitigation. The security researcher noted that in July of this year, Microsoft published a blog about removing these insecure legacy practices from their environments, but they did not provide any transparency about how many services still use these tokens. In this case, there's no need for a token to leak at all, and of course, the data the attacker obtains will not be limited to a single tenant. Everything I just listed was extremely poor security practices, but now, it's time to get into their real vulnerability. We know that these tokens can be used to impersonate a user on any Microsoft resource. In this case, the security researcher was interested in impersonating users on the incredibly powerful Azure AD Graph API. As a security researcher tested various fields of these impersonation tokens, they changed the tenant ID to a completely different tenant than was issued in the original actor token. Needless to say, the Azure API should have returned an access denied message. However, to their surprise, when they tested this, they received a curious error message instead stating that the user ID was not found. This suggested that the tenant ID change was actually accepted and that the specified user did not exist within this newly specified tenant. Sure enough, after changing the user ID to a valid user ID within this secondary tenant, the Azure API happily returned valid responses, containing data from the tenant that they manually specified only in the impersonation token, despite being a mismatch from the tenant ID specified in the original actor token.
As it turns out, the Azure API was failing to properly validate the originating tenant within the actor token, allowing cross-tenant access. Just to be clear, this means that you do not need to find an actor token from an actual victim tenant. An attacker can simply create their own tenant and use that actor token since the tenant ID tied to the token is not validated at all. Let's take a step back here. This means that in order to access the data from any tenant in the entire world, you would only need two things. The tenant ID of the victim tenant, and a user ID of a user within the victim tenant. As it turns out, the tenant IDs are actually public information. For example, here I am getting the tenant ID of Microsoft themselves. The only real hurdle is getting the user ID of a user in a specific tenant. However, the security researcher also discovered a method that can be used to get the user ID for a user in every single tenant globally. On top of this, we don't even need to worry about whether the user ID belongs to a global admin or not. The security researcher shows that even if you impersonate a regular user, you can use them to list all of the global admins within the tenant, and then forge another impersonation token using the newly found global admins user ID. The security researcher also points out a few things that you can practically do once you gain access to a tenant. For example, the attacker could create a new user account, grant it global admin, and then be able to sign in to any Entra ID, MS365, or third-party application that integrates with the victim tenant. Now, they essentially have a backdoor account that will persist beyond the 24-hour window and even after the vulnerability is patched. They could also create new credentials on existing third-party apps and then grant the app itself permission to access MS365 data, and then use these credentials to authenticate as the application in order to exfiltrate all of the emails or files as the application in order to lower suspicions. Lastly, they could have also added credentials to Microsoft service principles in the victim tenant, several of which can request actor tokens that allow impersonation against SharePoint or Exchange. This way, even after the vulnerability is patched, you have a source actor token that was generated within the victim tenant rather than the attacker's own tenant, meaning that the attacker can keep their access and use this token to generate a fresh actor token every single 24 hours. At this point, the only real bottleneck is finding any initial user ID for any user within a victim tenant. The security researcher points out that since these user IDs don't expire, any user ID, even from an old, unrelated data breach, would provide the attacker with enough information to breach the tenant, so long as the user account still exists. But this isn't any old vulnerability. This really is as serious as I claimed it was at the beginning of the video. We don't need to rely on any leaked information, and we're truly able to breach any tenant globally. Let's take a look at the format of these user IDs. These user IDs are 16-digit hexadecimal strings. These IDs are also not randomly generated, but they're actually incremental. The security researcher did an analysis and found that the difference between a newly created user ID in their own tenant and the newest user ID in the other tenants that they analyzed tended to be in the order of 100,000 to 100 million. This means that simply brute forcing a user ID in any target tenant would only take minutes to hours. In addition to this, no logs would be generated, making brute forcing a completely feasible way to compromise any tenant globally. At this point, this was already enough to deem this attack possible without any prerequisites. However, our security researcher decided to take things one step further and designed a solution to be able to pull this off without any brute forcing necessary. This is a little abstract, and not even technically required, so we'll try and keep things brief. Basically, there exists a concept of guest accounts. Sometimes an organization might have the need to invite a user from another tenant to have guest access in their own tenant. In this case, let's say that tenant A sends a guest invite to a user from tenant B. This means that there is only trust in one direction, as tenant A is trusting the user from tenant B to be within their environment. When a guest invite is accepted, the real user ID for the user that was invited from tenant B would be stored in tenant A in an attribute called alternative security IDs. 
This means that if an attacker used this vulnerability already to gain access to Tenant A, they can simply read the real user ID of the user from Tenant B, and then use this to craft an impersonation token for Tenant B. This way, the attack works against the direction of the trust. Tenant A trusted Tenant B, but now, an attacker with access to Tenant A can actually compromise Tenant B. Of course, as previously stated, once an attacker impersonates a user from Tenant B in their own home tenant, they can now enumerate all of the global admins and fully compromise the entire tenant. The security researcher points out that this entire process can be done in two API calls per tenant, since most tenants will have guest users from multiple distinct other tenants. This means that the number of tenants you can compromise will actually scale exponentially, and the information needed to compromise the majority of tenants worldwide could be gathered within minutes of using a single actor token. This vulnerability was originally discovered back in July, and patched shortly afterward. However, the details of this were not made public until September 2025. If you made it this far, you might be interested in subscribing to the channel and checking out some of my other content. And as always, thanks for watching.